Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The latest edition of the Integrated Resource Plan for Electricity, or IRP 2025, has been approved. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss what it says and what some of the reactions have been. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. The latest update of the IRP has been anticipated and debated for some time. Yes, that's right. This has uh, become the tradition in South Africa. So the Integrated Resource Plan is meant to be a sort of a techno-economic exercise. We're supposed to see regular updates. In fact, there's supposed to be almost a yearly update to this. But every time we update this, it, it goes through a horse trading, a political horse trading process and a number of uh, sort of levels before it actually comes out and is approved. So in this case, it's actually one of the quicker <laughs> updates we've seen historically. But it started before the GNU was formed. There was a plan that was put out, uh, sort of scantily consulted. Uh, very unhappy reactions to that. The, the new minister then took it through a new process using Sanedi and also had a very truncated public consultation process. Still a lot of unhappiness. It then went into the NEDLAC cycle and now, as we see, Cabinet has approved it. So in historical terms, a fairly quick turn of run from 2019 uh, to 2025, but it's not really what it's supposed to be. This is supposed to be a living document that, you know, we, we update regularly and we see it really driven by the techno-economic analysis rather than the political horse trading. But that's the reality and that's where we are at. What are the main components of the plan? So the main components looks at the generation technologies and the, how the mix uh, of the ch technologies will meet demand over a certain period. And, and the, the horizon that we've got here is up to 2039. And basically showing that there's going to be different technologies being, in generation technologies being introduced over that period. So there's a lot of, uh, as we would anticipate, a lot of uh, wind, a lot of solar, um, solar in two forms, a utility scale solar, um, and then also a distributed, which will be mo distributed, which is behind the meter, which will be mostly in the form of sort of rooftop solar that will come into the system. Then uh, it's got no new additional coal, but it's, it does have a plan to add so-called clean coal. The technology is not clear at all. It's going to be a demonstration case uh, to try and prove this up. Uh, so it continues to have a, a coal in the mix up to 2039. And then it's got uh, uh, nuclear, 5.2 gigawatts of new nuclear, supposedly built towards the, the latter half uh, of the 2030s um, coming in. And then it's got uh, a, a big gas to power component, a really fairly sizable, um, and that will, there's a 6,000 or 6 gigawatts that the, that the plan intends to have built by 2030, which is not long away at all. And then uh, I think another 10,000 till 2039. So that's the sort of mix of technologies. Uh, it costed at about 2.2 trillion rand. So that's really the overarching framework uh, that has been presented. And uh, that's what we supposedly is going to direct the, 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 the market to, uh, to sort of respond with those technologies. Some of the components have been the result of policy adjustments. Yes, so uh, every, you know, this is a techno-economic exercise uh, and the base case is a lease cost. Now we haven't really got transparency of what that lease cost uh, uh, says and what, uh, what the, the costs are of that. But then government makes decisions around what it feels it needs to do to add certain policies to bring in other technologies to support other industries and some significant policy adjustments have been made. I think some of the big ones are this clean coal testing. Uh, can you approve clean coal? Now, if they do, it looks like this plan intends to keep 40,000 megawatts of coal in the system by 2039. I, I assume that means that you'll retire those 5,000 megawatts, as we've got 45 at the moment, um, that are planned to retire by 2030, and then they're going to try and retrofit the existing fleet somehow with clean systems and keep that going. So that's that's a major decision. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't work, it's got major security of supply implications. Then the other big uh, decision um, uh, is the 50% load factor for the f initial gas to power plants. So, you know, initially it was supposed to be a very flexible 
sort of generation profile. So you can operate between 25% and 65%, depending on what the system needs, but nowhere near a minimum uh, load factor of uh, 50%. So those initial 6,000 megawatts are going to be operating, uh, uh, and we don't know over what period. We assume maybe 20 years. Now that's so that makes a hard wires in a dotted denominated uh, electrons into the system because we're going to have to import the gas in the form of liquefied natural gas. None of that infrastructure is in place, neither in Mozambique nor in South Africa yet, which are the two most advanced, Richards Bay and Matola. That doesn't exist yet. But, and these are sort of, so and the idea there is not just to produce electricity to close the gaps as coal plants start retiring, those first 5,000 megawatts, but uh, to, to also provide an anchor, it seems, for another policy imperative, and that's to bring in liquefied natural gas so that it can be used as the imports from southern Mozambique wane from Sassel uh, to supplement that supply so that industry in South Africa can use gas directly in their plants to make everything from steel to glass. So that's a big policy adjustment and also has big cost implications, which I don't think are totally transparent at the moment. The other thing is, can it be done in the time frame? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions about what, what that means, given that we don't have um, these facilities, import facilities, the regasification facilities, the pipeline network in place. But anyway, that's what the plan is saying, but uh, but it's a big policy adjustment. And then the, the normal policy adjustment is the nuclear one, always forcing in nuclear. There's no way it can come in cost effectively using any technology costs that are out there. And also saying that they might it might be conventional nuclear pressurized water reactors and then all, all small modular reactors which haven't been commercially licensed or proven mostly. So that's sort of probably not in the the realm of possibility immediately anyway. But uh, to their credit, they haven't put that in for the next few years. There's not, nothing nuclear is going to happen in 20, by 2030. This is all very much in the 20, 25, uh, 2035 onwards sort of time frame. And the, uh, the scale that they're talking about very much looks like a pressurized water reactor, 1,250 megawatts a year. Uh, tranches to get to that 5,200 and they put out if we can really get our act together maybe it can be up as much as 10,000 megawatts so <laughs> that's very ambitious again the costs there I mean uh, uh, um, versus least cost they say there's uh, not a big deviation but there must be a big deviation if you take all those especially we don't know what clean coal is going to cost we don't know if we uh, what uh, small modular reactors are going to cost at all uh, and the gas to power, we know kind of what it costs, but there's a lot of uh, vagaries around what it's, you know, the, the ongoing fuel costs are going to be and how you're going to hedge that because it is going to bring a dollar denomination into our electricity system, which is traditionally around coal, uh, which has been RAN based. So it's a big change. What has the reaction been so far? Mixed, I would say. So there's a lot of, you know, pent up energy wanting to start building from different associations. So obviously the gas and the nuclear guys are very happy with this and they feel it gives them a real new lease of life. So there's, they want all systems go now, <clears throat> but there's still concern, for instance, on the gas side, what I mentioned, the supply side. Um, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of <laughs> things that have to happen and be put in place, infrastructure has to be put in place to make this realistic. So. Anyway, there's a lot of happiness there, a lot of happiness on the nuclear side. Even on the, the wind and solar side, they're just so happy there's, you know, there's, there's allocation available, let's get going. But I think more the sort of uh, people are analysing it from a system perspective would like to understand more what the cost implications of this. It seems the most, potentially the most expensive RP we've ever put out into the market at a, t at a time when affordability is the issue of the day. So you kind of think, what what is going on here? You know, you, uh, you know, we can see that households are struggling. We see that industries are closing because of electricity costs. And now we put out a plan that looks really, really very expensive. The other signal that was given by the minister was this is going to be a state-led initiative. Um, and But there's no money from the state. Eskom trades with taxpayer support at the moment. So it's going to be state-led and the market must follow. But 
at the moment, the only game in town has really been the market um, for looking at all the private um, PPAs. Uh, and those have all been around wind, soda and battery storage. Uh, battery storage, I've mentioned, there is a component there for battery storage as well in the plan. So those, we know what the costs are. We know that they can be financed. We know that they can be built. And we know that they, what sort of level of competitive electrons they produce and how they need to be supported by things like storage, for instance. But that seems to be undersized in the plan. So there's a lot of mixed uh, signals. And the other thing about being state-led at the time and central planning, centralized procurement through the IPP office, which is what the signal is, seems to contradict where we are legislatively. You know, we've got a new Electricity Regulation Amendment Act, which talks about going into a competitive type setting. And we just about to launch a, a South African wholesale market for electricity. And these are sort of contradictory. Centralized procurement will contradict that. So what will be the market? What will be in the market? It's, it's unclear now if you're going to have all this uh, sort of um, electricity being procured on the side. So it's, it's, it seems quite muddled. It seems very expensive. And the, the lack of transparency is a worry. So that's, so that's where we're at. But as I say, there's this pent up desire to start building. The, the big worry is that if, if it's so muddled and it's so confused and grid for instance, grid capacity, which is a constraint, is set aside, for instance, for technologies that can't be built by 2030, uh, but it's reserved. We can really realistically think that we could go back into a load shedding period. So they are, this is not cost free. This is not risk free making these sort of decisions. So I think this is a high risk and a high cost plan, and I think it's not really implementable. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.